Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. We'll go ahead and get started and welcome to this webinar. Could you please indicate again if you still could hear me well? Thank you so much. So let's go ahead and start. Our topic for today is oxygenation and oxygen devices. We will begin with physiological concepts of oxygenation so that we can understand why we have to intervene with this particular devices that uh, delivers oxygen, okay? So please make sure that you raise your hands whenever you have a question and please stop me whenever you do have a question by raising your hand or if you don't see me responding to it, that means to say that I haven't read it. And therefore you could unmute your microphones and then raise your questions. So it's my pleasure to welcome you once again to this webinar. My name is Dr. Tom Madayag and we will discuss oxygenation. So before we proceed, I wanted to ask you what percent of oxygen is in the air that we breathe? Could you please respond? All right. So everyone is saying that it is 21%. In actuality, the um, uh, accurate uh, percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere it is 20.88%. But nonetheless, it is 21%. So the next question that I'm going to ask you is, what are the other gases that are present in the atmosphere that we breathe? Nitrogen, okay. And how many percent is nitrogen? How many percent is nitrogen? 28%, okay, very good. So now what I'd like to do is to share my, um, my board with you. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the atmosphere that we breathe and the composition of the gases so that we can understand it as a physiologic uh, entity, okay? Hold on one moment. Okay, just wanted to make sure that you see my whiteboard at the moment. The atmosphere that we breathe consists of the following gases, 78% nitrogen. And as we said, it's 20.88 of oxygen. And that would be 21% um, in um, rounded up. And of course the other gases would be 1%. So the next question that I'm going to ask you is this, what is the purpose, why, there is a greater percentage of nitrogen than oxygen in the atmosphere. Why is there more nitrogen in the atmosphere? What's the physiologic basis and importance of this gas? Anyone? Okay, it's necessary for the growth of plants. Uh, what, is, uh, what is its importance to human physiology? Okay, because we're talking about oxygenation. Okay, so let's go ahead and discuss why that is. Now, when you breathe, obviously the alveoli is going to enlarge correct? And when you exhale, the alveoli partially collapses. In other words, 
contrary to what we think of, we think that when we exhale, the alveoli totally collapses. That is not so. The reason why it stays partially open is because of the influence of nitrogen. Nitrogen, therefore, keeps the alveoli open even when we are not breathing, uh, when we are not inhaling, I should say. So the purpose then of nitrogen is very, very important in the sense that it keeps the alveoli partially open even during exhalation. So what is the importance of why this alveoli needs to be open longer? The reason why it's important is because by prolonging the, uh, the alveoli being in this position, you are prolonging the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So if you remember, if this is the alveoli and this is the capillary network, the longer this alveoli is going to be inflated, the more possibilities therefore for the exchange of gases, namely oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now, the way in which the alveoli remains partially open during exhalation is what we call physiologic PEEP or positive and expiratory pressure, okay? That's physiologic PEEP. This is different from the PEEP that is going to be applied to a patient who is on a ventilator, for example, okay? So we have an artificial PEEP that we do with a ventilator, but physiologically or naturally, the PEEP is maintained in our respiratory system by the influence of nitrogen in the atmosphere. All right, so further then, What's going to be important here is that what happens if we have a um, oxygen concentration that we're going to give to a patient that exceeds the pressure of nitrogen. So what am I saying here? So again, let's say that I am giving a patient 100% oxygen. So this is the alveoli, and you are giving 100% of oxygen. What happens to our nitrogen then? You remember nitrogen in the atmosphere is 78%. What would happen to that nitrogen? Hello? Can you answer? What happens to the nitrogen? Okay, Pierce says no more nitrogen. Well, actually you wash out, you wash out the nitrogen. In other words, the nitrogen is going to be blown off. And therefore, if you don't have any nitrogen, what happens to the alveoli? What happens to the alveoli? It collapses. This results in a condition known as ARDS. So the principle here therefore is that we are cautious anytime we give oxygen beyond 78%. In fact, when you give oxygen of around 60% concentration, what's going to happen is you're going to wash off part of the nitrogen. And therefore it results in a condition known as ARDS. Thus, in the principle of oxygenation, at all times, we try to limit the amount of concentration of oxygen that we give to patients because of this principle.
So what we've talked about so far is the principle that in the atmosphere is 78% of nitrogen. And the purpose of that nitrogen is to exert the physiologic PEEP or the positive and expiratory pressure. And we also learned in this discussion that whenever we increase the concentration of oxygen beyond 78%, that the likelihood of alveolar collapse is going to be very high. So that is exactly the um, principle of oxygenation that we are after, okay? So let's, um, let's go back to our discussion, therefore, okay? So I have a question, another question. Sorry about that. Uh, All right, when you turn the oxygen meter to one liter per minute, what is the FiO2 or the fraction of inspired oxygen that you're giving to the patient? All right, so Maria is saying 40%, Marisa 24%, April is saying uh, 24%, all of you are saying 24%. Well, what would happen if I um, turn the dial to five liters per minute? Mm-hmm. All right, so that's the reason why we need to have this class. It's because of the fact that we certainly sometimes don't have the understanding of this oxygen devices because we always say, well, it's the uh, purview or uh, the um, territory of the physical therapist and the physician. So we need to know oxygenation. I'm sorry to tell you that you're all wrong. Anytime that you turn on this dial right here, you're going to have a exit of oxygen, sorry about that, of 100%, 100%. If I turn the dial to one liter, what comes out here is 100%. If I turn it to five liters, it still would be 100%. If I put it to 15 liters, it would still be 100%. Do we understand that? The amount of oxygen that comes out from here is always going to be 100%. But you're saying, but what happens when I put an acyl cannula? They say that we can only increase the FiO2 to 24%. Or what happens if I put a partial rebreathing mass uh, you say that it could give the patient 60%. Why is that? Well, the device that you put or to deliver this particular oxygen is the one that limits the amount of FiO2 that the patient will eventually get. Okay? So having understood that then, what we're going to talk about now is principles of oxygenation in relationship to delivery devices. So we're going to talk about two concepts, oxygen flow rate, what you dial, what you dial on the flow meter, and the FiO2, FiO2 is what is known as the fraction of inspired oxygen, which is the percentage or concentration of oxygen that the patient inhales. So if I ask you, what is your FiO2 right now? 
What is the answer? What is your FIO2 right now? Correct, you are breathing 21% of oxygen or 20.88% of oxygen, correct. So whenever we are giving oxygen to a device, we are increasing obviously the FIO2 of that patient. So let's begin with delivery devices. There are three systems basically that assist us in giving or delivering oxygen. Oxygen delivery devices are used to administer supplemental oxygen. And the reason why this is important is because it is going to increase the patient's oxygenation. So basically what happens is that these devices are able to entrain or mix oxygen and air thus making a fixed concentration of oxygen, which can then be delivered to the patient. So oxygen delivery devices can be low flow or high flow. Low flow devices deliver oxygen rates at a flow rate of eight liters per minute or less. The flow rate is less than a normal adult requirement for inspiration. So, these are the types of devices that we're going to talk about. And when we take a look at the concentrations of oxygen that they deliver, they vary. So in this discussion, then we will look at all the devices depicted in this slide. Following each type, there will be questions that will require you to answer. So let's take a look at this devices, starting with the nasal cannula. So I just wanna pause here to see if there are any questions so far. Any questions so far? Okay, none. Let's go ahead with the first device and that's nasal cannula. So I have a poll again. And the question is, there are two patients demonstrating this respiratory rates. Which respiratory rate will nasal cannula delivery be most effective? Your answers? Okay, everybody seems to be saying slow and uh, I, I'm glad to tell you that it, this is a correct uh, answer. The reason why we don't want to give nasal cannula as a device to patients with tachypnea is because the faster you breathe, the lesser amount of oxygen is actually absorbed because by the time it goes into your respiratory tract, the exhalation process, now pushes again what you had inhaled. Thus, the first principle for the use of nasal cannula is it should be given to patients who have slow breathing patterns, not to patients that have tachypnea. Now, a nasal cannula is a typical low flow oxygen system that provides supplemental oxygen less than the patient's total minute ventilation. So the oxygen that's delivered in this device will be diluted by the air that the patient breathes and thus the inspired oxygen delivery is less. So it mixes with the atmosphere. So despite the fact that we're providing 100% through this device, we're actually diluting it from the atmospheric air or the ambient air that the patient breathes, okay? So 
the amount of oxygen that you're actually going to deliver to a patient is being diluted by the oxygen in the ambient atmosphere. So what are some of the important concepts to remember when you're using the nasal cannula? The standard nasal cannula delivers an FiO2 of between 24 to 44%. And this ranges from um, one to six liters per minute as a flow range, okay? So whenever you are giving oxygen, actually for each liter of flow, you're going to increase the FiO2 by 4%. So what do I mean by that? So let's just go back to the board again, okay? Um, and I'm going to do this, oops. There you go. So what I wanted to uh, say is that whenever you are giving oxygen, and uh, let's say now that you are giving one liter of oxygen. Uh, so, Oops, it's not writing, hold on one moment. Uh, let's just do this. Let's say now that I'm giving you one liter of oxygen, as you could see over here, you increase the oxygen by 4%. Do you remember that we're breathing 20.88% of oxygen? So if you give one liter, you're actually increasing the FiO2 to 24.88%, or we could just say 24%. And if you increase it by two liters, so you add another 4% 4 4 that would be 28%. If you give three liters, then that would be 32%. So you just keep on adding 4% of oxygen's FiO2. Is that clear? So if I give you three liters of oxygen by nasal cannula, what percent are you breathing? If I give you three liters of oxygen, okay, very good. So your FiO2 becomes 32%, okay? So a humidification device is recommended on deliveries that are greater than four liters per minute to ensure humidification of the dry uh, inspired gas. Uh, let me just mute everyone. So uh, whenever we are giving oxygen then, we're always going to think about the fact that it is dependent upon the depth and rate of breathing of the patient. The slower the inspiratory flow, the higher it is that the patient will eventually get a, as an FiO2. The best clinical indications for nasal cannula are for patients who have a relatively stable respiratory pattern, who require low oxygen percentage, or who only need supplemental oxygenation. All right, your answers. What are your answers? 
Okay. All right. Jessica says a hundred percent. Okay. So let's go back to one simple um, instruction over here. The limit of the delivery of a nasal cannula is going to be at six liters per minute, which means to say that it is going to be uh, right over here, 44%. What are we saying here? <clears throat> that if you have a nasal cannula, and you put the liter flow to 15 liters per minute, it would still just deliver only 44%. Let me repeat that, because this is a common mistake of nurses. They see that the patient is not doing very well. Let's say now that the patient is in shock, and now, they put the nasal cannula with a flow of 15 liters per minute. Does that mean to say that the patient is getting 100%? And the answer to that is no. Whether you give two, I mean, we give, you give seven, eight, nine, 10, it is still going to deliver 44% because of the limitation of the tubing as a delivery device. It cannot exceed or it cannot go beyond the potential of 44%. Do we understand that? And that is the reason why the answer to this question was 44%, letter B. Okay, so think about it now then that whenever you want a high FiO2 delivered to a patient, particularly if you want 100%, the nasal cannula is not going to be the appropriate device to use for this particular patient. Yes, now I understand perhaps that it's the reason why there's a change from nasal cannula to face mask when oxygen needed is greater than six liters per minute. Great, okay, wonderful. Any questions about nasal cannula? All right, so remember, you can only get up to 44% for a nasal cannula, regardless of what you do to the flow. Because of the tubing, it limits the amount of oxygen or FiO2 that the patient eventually will get. All right, let's now go to another device. And the next device that we're going to talk about is a simple face mask. And I'm sure that all of you have had the opportunity to use a simple face mask. And maybe a lot of you are thinking, well, I know it all about face masks. Well, that's good, but I want to make sure that we all have the basic principles and the important considerations with the use of a simple face mask. The simple face mask can deliver higher flow rates than nasal cannula and it has the potential to deliver an FiO2 of around 35 to 60%. So remember that, 35 to 60%. Um, that is with flow rates of around six to 10 liters per minute. 
Now, what is the simple face mask? The simple face mask is a low flow delivery system like a nasal cannula. It fits over the nose and the mouth with open side ports as you can see uh, right over here are your, let me just, uh, right over here are openings. These are the side ports. And these side ports allow the air to enter and dilute the oxygen as well as allow for carbon dioxide to escape, okay? So basically, the amount of oxygen that's coming up to here is how many percent? How many percent is the oxygen coming from the wall, right, going over here? A hundred percent, very good. But because of this holes over here, ambient atmosphere will mix with it and therefore the patient is not going to get 100%, okay? Now, the fact that you have a mask, however, right over here, theoretically increases the size of the oxygen reservoir beyond the normal anatomic reservoir. Therefore, you achieve a higher FiO2 as compared to the nasal cannula. However, like nasal cannula, the FiO2 that is inspired will vary um, depending on the patient's inspiratory flow rate, the depth of breathing, um, the fit of the mask, and the patient's respiratory rate. So we usually use this device when an increased delivery um, is going to be available. Uh, there's a question, will this recording be available later? Yes, uh, the recording is always going to be available and both on Canvas and also on YouTube, okay? Thank you for asking me that. All right. So uh, the important thing about this face mask are two things, and I'm going to discuss that right after this question. If we breathe in, oxygen at 21%, what amount of carbon dioxide is breathed out whenever we exhale? Okay, I'm talking about the carbon dioxide now. How much carbon dioxide are you exhaling? So think about what is the normal of uh, PCO2 or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood. So let's begin there. Thirty-five to forty-five. Okay, very good. So why am I asking you that? All right, so the CO2 that is exhaled is going to be 35 to 45, so an average of 40%, okay? So why is this important? This is important because if a patient is receiving a face mask, uh, oxygen to a face mask, so let's say now that this is the face mask, and this is the patient right here, okay? So if we're giving, let's say two liters of oxygen, how many percent of oxygen are you actually delivering to a patient if you're giving two liters per minute? Hello? 
28%. Okay, very good. Now, um, let me just, um, yeah, let me just change the ink over here. So the patient is breathing out carbon dioxide. What is the pressure of carbon dioxide that we said that the patient exhales? Forty percent. Okay, so the patient is breathing out forty percent. So twenty-eight percent versus forty percent. Which one is stronger? Which is going to be stronger? The CO two. So basically, when you are giving an oxygen concentration that is going to be, uh, what do you call this? This is going to be a problem when you give a patient a lesser concentration of oxygen than the expired carbon dioxide. So there's a principle that we're going to always um, follow. And that is that whenever we're giving a oxygen to a simple face mask, that we must have a concentration of flow that is more than five liters per minute. You cannot apply a face mask to a patient if the flow rate is less than five liters per minute. The reason is, the carbon dioxide will be trapped over here, and therefore the patient will be breathing carbon dioxide instead of breathing oxygen. Yes, Pierre, that is correct. So let me tell you a story, and this is a true story, uh, wherein I had a patient one time, uh, while I was charting, it was around in the afternoon, and uh, a wife of a patient comes to me and says, Tom, could you please check on my husband? And I said, what's wrong? She said, after lunch, he has been very sleepy. I could not wake him up. So whenever you have a patient with a respiratory problem or a respiratory diagnosis, whenever a patient is very sleepy, there is only one thing that you should think of that there is CO2 narcosis. The accumulation of carbon dioxide in the body makes the patient very sleepy. And therefore, this is the term to describe it called CO2 narcosis. So immediately when she said that, I thought about, well, maybe this patient is retaining carbon dioxide. So I go to the patient's room and I assess the patient, and I notice that the oxygen uh, is at two liters per minute, but the patient was on a face mask. And I said, this could not be. When I made my rounds at lunchtime, the patient was on a nasal cannula, and now I've discovered this patient to be on a face mask with a flow rate of two liters per minute. So I said, who changed this device? And she said, oh, I asked the nursing assistant to change it because he has been complaining of his nose being so sore. And therefore, this is the reason why the patient is very sleepy. The nursing assistant did not ask my permission. She went ahead and changed the oxygen device without any knowledge of what it does to the patient if the flow rate is less than five liters per minute. So the moral of the story here is that whenever you have a face mask, which is the device that you are going to be using to deliver supplemental oxygen, ensure or make sure that there is going to be at least five liters per minute to prevent the rebreathing of exhaled gases. Okay, all right. So the other advantage of a simple face mask is it's suitable for uh, patients who are mouth breathers as well as nose breathers. 
So that would be, or those would be the reasons why we would use this device. Let's move on. But before you, um, I, I do that, let's see if you have any questions. Do you have any questions? I yeah, appear, go ahead. Do you have a question? Here, you have a question. That is correct. Uh, it should be more than five. So five and a half or six would be fine because a, uh, 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 you remember you're trying to counteract the 40% or the 35 to 45% of carbon dioxide that's going to be exhaled by the patient. Thank you for raising that question, Pierre. All right, we're now going to proceed with the next device, and that is the Venturi mask. All right, so uh, I'm sure that most of you have already experienced uh, putting a patient on a Venturi mask. So what is the principle of this particular device? Well, let's go ahead and move over here. The most important principle is this one. You notice that each of these devices have openings like this. Okay, so these are based on this principle below, but I think I'm going to Right, so I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to use the whiteboard again and share these. Okay, so the device known as a Venturi mass is designed this way. Um, so there are openings over here, openings over here. And the purpose of this is from the wall, oxygen goes over here. How many percent is coming from the wall? How many percent of oxygen is coming from the wall? A hundred percent, okay. So the a hundred percent is going over here, but we have air, that's 21% mixing with it over here for final delivery to the patient. So the patient actually deliver, I mean, gets or uh, receives oxygen based on the opening over here, okay? So what does that mean? The bigger the opening, so let's have, a device that's this way and a device. Okay. So this is A and this is B. Which one will eventually provide the patient a higher percentage of oxygen? Is it letter A or letter B? which one will provide a higher concentration of oxygen to the patient? Is it going to be letter A or letter B? Very good, letter B, because there's a smaller opening over here, and therefore the more concentrated oxygen from the wall will be eventually delivered to the patient. Excellent, okay. So let's go back to our presentation over here. <clears throat> so you understand now, therefore, this principle right over here. As you could see, the Venturi mass, and I'm going to uh, zoom in over here. 
As you could see, there are wider openings, which would be 24%. And as you go to smaller openings, like here, it is now 60%. In essence, this Venturi mass is also referred to as a Benti mass. It is classified as an air entrainment mass. So what happens is this mass mixes with oxygen <clears throat> and room air, which would therefore create a high flow in rich oxygen of a desired concentration. It provides an accurate, and constant FiO2, despite maybe with the varied respiratory rates and tidal volumes of the patient. So the FiO2 delivery of this uh, device is uh, typically set at 24, 28, 31, 35, and 40% oxygen. So this, Device is often employed when the clinician has a concern about carbon dioxide retention or when the respiratory drive is inconsistent. You do not need humidification with this device. Um, and the, this device is actually very ideal and often utilized in patients with COPD where the risk of knocking out the patient's hypoxic drive is of concern, okay? All right, so remember now that I'm going to lower this, no. Remember now that these openings right over here are very, very important. So you should always make sure that you're going to guard these openings. So I have a question. If a patient with a Venturi mask accidentally covers the opening, these opening with let's say the blanket, what will happen to the amount of oxygen delivered to his lungs? What will happen? Okay, I'm glad that you understood that. Yes, the patient will get more percentage of oxygen and therefore we don't want to do that. Okay, so whenever you're delivering this particular device, always make sure to use this particular guard. It's a, um, what do you call that? Um, a guard for the holes right over here so that the patient will not accidentally cover it by mistake. Okay. So we talk a little bit about um, hypoxic drive. So I wanted to address that a little bit before we go forward to discussing the next type of oxygen devices. So I'm sure that you all have a um, idea of what the hypoxic drive is going to be. But let's go ahead and uh, talk about it nonetheless, okay? So whenever you have, um, uh, let me rephrase that. What stimulates us to breathe? What is the stimuli to breathing? Anybody? Okay. So is it the need for oxygen or is it the need for 
releasing or eliminating carbon dioxide. Okay, the normal physiologic reason why we breathe is the need for eliminating carbon dioxide, okay? So whenever you have a patient with COPD or any condition wherein you retain chronically carbon dioxide, what happens is that this is no longer the stimuli for breathing. So for patients with chronic CO2 retention, their drive is going to be the need for oxygen. So therefore, if a patient is having COPD and now you give oxygen, that's going to be five liters per minute. Now, what have you done? You have now satisfied the need for oxygen. When you satisfy the need for oxygen, what then is going to happen? The patient will no longer breathe. And that's the reason why there is this underlying principle that we should be very cautious in giving oxygen to patients with chronic CO2 retention. So my next question is this. Can you give a patient with COPD four liters of oxygen by nasal cannula? True or false? Can you give oxygen to a patient with COPD and you're giving four liters per minute by nasal cannula? All right, so uh, Ellen is saying only one to two liters. Jessica is saying the same thing. No, 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 okay. How about the others? There's 26 of you. All right, no, no, no. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to do now is to dispel the myth that we have been taught for a long time. Now, Florence Nightingale told us that we should never give oxygen to a patients with COPD of more than two liters per minute because it knocks down the respiratory drive. Well, I have a YouTube um, video uh, on, um, on evidence-based practice in nursing. So if you have an opportunity to watch that, I would like for you to do that because evidence now have shown or research have shown that we could safely give patients with COPD oxygen for as much as we can. That's the new thinking. And in fact, they say that you're going to actually give safely oxygen to a patient, even if it's six liters per minute or 10 liters per minute, to maintain the oxygen saturation at 92%. So whatever amount of oxygen that's needed to maintain the O2 saturation of 92% is okay to a patient with COPD. This is evidence-based practice. So please remove that from your mind from now on. Because I know that you have been taught by Florence Nightingale like I did. She said that we should not give patients with COPD more than two liters per minute. But actually, science and evidence have shown, or research have shown, that we could safely deliver oxygen for as much as we can give. The caveat is whatever can maintain an oxygen saturation of 92%. Is that clear? 
So from now on, remove that from your brain, okay? It's harder to undo previous learning than to learn new learning or new knowledge. Any questions? Okay, so there's a question here by Maria. Can we give high concentrations of oxygen without doctor's orders? It depends on your facility. Uh, oxygen is a drug, so basically it, it needs a physician's order. For people that work in critical care, we usually have uh, standing orders and you are covered to uh, change the delivery um, system of a patient, um, depending again on the policy and the standing order of your facility. So in most ICU settings that I have worked at, the nurse has the um, freedom to choose the amount, I mean, the delivery system as appropriate, but that's based on standing physician's orders, okay? All right, Eunice, thank you. Sure, Maria. Okay, let's move forward now. And uh, if you don't have any questions, let's go now to the next device. And this device is known as a reservoir nasal cannula. Okay, so reservoir nasal cannulas are oxygen conserving devices. In other words, you want to conserve the oxygen that's being given to the patient. Because like, for example, if you're a chronic lunger, you don't want to spend the whole tank in 24 hours. So you wanna conserve it as much as possible. So what this reservoir nasal cannula is there for is exactly that they save oxygen. But before explaining that, let me ask you a question. The gas that we exhale is pure carbon dioxide, true or false? Okay, I'm glad that you all answered that. So before we go to a discussion on, the, um, uh, on this particular device, what I'd like to do is to discuss something about the dead space, the anatomic dead space that we refer to, okay? So let's see, let me just do a whiteboard and okay. So a respiratory system consists of the oropharynx and then of course the trachea and then the trachea bifurcates at around the second intercostal space to the right and left main stem bronchus and then it goes into the acinar units where there is alveoli. So the group of alveoli are called the acinar units. And uh, let me just, uh, uh, okay. so whenever you breathe and oxygen comes over here, the oxygen that is going to be in the acinar units are absorbed. They are the ones that are absorbed. But the oxygen that is going to be in these conduit right here is going to be remaining in that particular tube. 
And that is the reason why these areas are called the anatomic dead space. So basically, when you are looking at this, this particular area over here is going to be rich in oxygen. And when you exhale, therefore, what happens is the first part of exhalation, the first third of exhalation is going to be oxygen first, okay? And that's the reason why when you give mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, for example, you're actually providing a rich oxygen in the first third of your exhalation. Do we understand that? So the oxygen that stays over here is going to be very, very important. And actually this anatomic dead space contains 150 cc's or more of oxygen. So whenever you breathe out, therefore, 150 cc's of oxygen is going to be exhaled. So wouldn't it be nice, therefore, if we save this oxygen? That exactly is the purpose of a device known as your oxygen reservoir devices. So whenever we have an oxygen device known as a reservoir cannula, right over here, as you could see, is a area wherein you try to collect the exhaled oxygen of the patient. So this device is what is known as an oximath or an oximizer. Uh, I don't know if any of you have used this and it might come like this, wherein the reservoir is going to be here or a pendant um, reservoir right over here. How many of you have seen this device? It usually is used by patients with chronic need for oxygen. Has anybody seen this device or used this device? Okay, great. So the purpose therefore of the, the, uh, the thing over here is going to be uh, the harvesting of exhaled oxygen. Okay. All right, Pierre, you will see this quite a whole lot, particularly when they come from the home. You will not see this much in the hospital, but patients who are in the outpatient probably will be using this quite a whole lot. When you see them outside, like in the grocery store, um, uh, you would see this. Uh, Tika, we don't use this for COVID patients. So well, I'll show you the one that we use for COVID patients, okay? And that's the high flow nasal cannula. This is different. This is going to be a different device. This is merely called an oximizer or, or an oximizer pendant, okay? All right. Let's now go to the next device, and that's the partial rebreathing mask. So what is a partial rebreathing mask? Well, as you could see in the picture right over here, we have a bag. What is the purpose of this bag? So let's talk a little bit about this partial rebreathing mask. This is another type of reservoir device. It consists of a simple face mask right over here and a non, um, um, what do you call that? It consists of a face mask and also a reservoir bag. So again, the purpose of this reservoir bag is to collect oxygen that the patient will be exhaling. Right? This is different from a non-rebreathing mask. 
And we're going to talk about why it's called a partial rebreathing mask. This device can deliver as much as 70% of FiO2 at flow rates of around six to 10 liters per minute. So what is the design of this mask? Let's take a look at the anatomy and the physics of this particular device. Okay, so we're talking about a partial rebreathing mask. The partial rebreathing mass is going to collect oxygen from two sources. One from the wall, this oxygen right here. And the second one is from the reservoir bag. So anytime, uh, let me just mute everybody. Anytime the patient breathes right over here, breathes out, there should be a inflation of this back because we're interested in collecting the first third of exhalation. So when the patient breathes out, the patient's first third of exhalation is going to be collected over here. Then the valve will shut. There will be a valve right over here that will shut to prevent the entry of carbon dioxide. So do you understand the anatomy of this particular device then? That there is a one-way valve that is going to protect the entry of more air into the back. It only allows the first third of exhalation to come into this back. So therefore, when a patient breathes in, the patient will now inhale the oxygen that's coming from this bag, as well as from the wall. And as the patient breathes out or exhales, this bag will therefore inflate, okay? So when does this bag inflate? Again, it should inflate on the patient's exhalation. Why is it inflating during patient's exhalation? Because the first third of the exhaled volume is gonna go into this bag. Do you understand? Okay, so there is a one-way valve therefore. It's a one, two-way valve over here. It allows for exhalation volume to go in and the volume of air that's in here to go out. So it has one two-way valves, one that allows the exhaled volume, the first third to come over here and also allows the air to go out. Is that clear? So, Whenever a patient therefore is not responding to a nasal cannula, to a face mask, to a venturi mask, then we can switch to a partial rebreathing mask because this has the capability of delivering oxygen up to around 70% at flow rates of six to 10 liters per minute. Okay? So, when the patient breathes, there's also an additional contribution of the volume of what the patient is going to breathe, and that is the holes at the side of this mass. So when the patient breathes, he actually is going to rebreathe part of the volume that he exhaled, as well as from the oxygen source and also from the ambient air. So there are three influencing air that is going to enter into the patient's anatomy. And that is the air coming from the atmosphere, the air that is going to come out from the patient, and the air that's coming from the oxygen uh, wall. So this therefore is going to deliver more oxygen to the patient.
Now in a non-rebreathing mass, which is going to be one that we use in order to increase the FiO2 of a patient, there's not going to be a recycling of the exhaled volume. So what the patient is going to be getting is going to be pure oxygen. So a non-rebreathing mass used to be the termination point before we intubate a patient. But nowadays, before doing that, we would put the patient into a um, CPAP and therefore that is going to be the last thing before we intubate the patient. But it used to be a non-rebreathing mass. So in summary, a non-rebreathing mass gives a high concentration of oxygen. This has a reservoir bag and it has a one-way valve that allows oxygen to be delivered to the reservoir bag during expiration and minimizes, um, of course, entrapment of oxygen. Why is that? Because there's a one-way valve over here that allows for exhaled volume to come out, but it does not allow for entry of air. So basically then, in a non-rebreathing mass, we do not recycle the oxygen that comes from the anatomical dead space. All we're giving is oxygen coming from the wall. Is that understood? By doing so, therefore, it is going to provide us with a higher concentration of FiO2. It can give us up to 100% of oxygen. Okay, noted, very good. So basically then the reservoir fills with 100% oxygen. The patient inhales from this device, from this reservoir, I should say. There is a one-way valve in the mass right over here, which prevents air from entering from the atmosphere. However, this valve opens only on exhalation. So as the patient breathes out, this will open up, allowing therefore for the carbon dioxide to exit. So there are practical considerations in the use of this device. Uh, to ensure the highest concentration of oxygen, uh, the patient, uh, the bag needs to be inflated all, at all times, and in fact should be inflated before placing it on the patient's face, okay? Make sure that the flow rate from the wall to the mass is adequate to maintain a fully inflated reservoir, during the whole respiratory cycle. There is no need for humidification in this device. It must be sufficient flow to keep the bag one third to one half inflated at all times. Make sure that you avoid kinking because if you kink it, you remember that the patient is only breathing from here and therefore if it is kink, the patient will be breathing zero oxygen. Okay. All right. Where is the two-way valve located in a partial rebreathing mass? Partial, partial rebreathing mass. The answer is B right here, okay? All right, good. 
So the next device that I'm going to tell you is the OxyMask. Before I discuss the OxyMask, I wanted to find out from you if you have experience using this device. No? Okay. I want to make sure everybody answers. No, 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 no. Okay. This is a wonderful device. And whenever you come to the United States, you will no longer see nasal cannula. It's very rare. You will never not see any more a face mask. You will not see a venti mask. You will not see an oxymizer, uh, a partial rebreathing mask or a non-rebreathing mask. Because this device can take care of all those particular devices. Okay, so this is the newest thing. Most hospitals will not stock uh, nasal cannulas anymore or face masks or uh, maybe um, a partial rebreathing mask or a non-rebreathing mask. What is the beauty of this particular device? Well, an oxymask is designed this way. And this is the reason why it is so uh, good and it is the preferred equipment to store in any particular area of the hospital. It uses, this device uses a diffuser and a pin. As illustrated here, there's a diffuser and a pin. The mushroom shaped pin right here redirects the flow of oxygen and the diffuser the, refines the shape of the oxygen vortex and directs the flow towards the patient's nose and mouth. This design therefore reduces bulk oxygen consumption by allowing a higher flow of FiO2 with less oxygen flow. Actually, this device can deliver anywhere from 24% to 90% FiO2 with flow rates from one to 15 liters per minute. And therefore it replaces the need for all other traditional oxygen devices. So as you could see over here, it can deliver one liter, 24% to 90% at 15 liters flow. And therefore it could take care of the device or it could cancel the need for nasal cannula, a simple face mask, a partial rebreathing mask or a non-rebreathing mask. So the secret to this is the design of the device which allows for the vortex of oxygen to be concentrated and pushed to the nose and the mouth. And therefore, it has the capability of delivering oxygen up to 90 liters per minute. Okay? And the last oxygen device that we're going to have is what is known as the high flow nasal cannula. Now, in light of COVID, a lot of you have been using this particular device. How many of you have used a high flow nasal cannula? How many of you have used a nasal, uh, high flow nasal cannula? Great. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, so just as a review, this is a relatively new oxygen delivery device, which is a high flow nasal cannula system. So this is a uh, form of respiratory support where oxygen is delivered to a patient at rates that are um, at the flow higher than that could be delivered traditionally in oxygen therapy. 
So what is the anatomy of the, and the physics of this particular device? So high flow oxygen therapy is usually delivered using a blender connected to a wall outlet, a humidifier, as well as a heated tubing and nasal cannula independent of the patient's inspiratory flow demands. So therefore this high flow oxygen delivery system supplies oxygen concentration at a flow equaling or exceeding the patient's uh, inspiratory flow demand. So whenever you are going to be using this, the important thing is the warm humidification of the air, which actually improves gas exchange, as well as it reduces the work of breathing. So high flow nasal cannula is very, very effective in the sense that it could um, uh, deliver oxygen up to 60 liters per minute. You remember that what we have on the wall, it's only up to 15. This particular device can deliver up to 60 liters per minute. So pictured here is one brand of high flow system and we call this the Vapotherm. And the advantages of the high flow nasal cannula is that it could wash out carbon dioxide from the anatomical dead space. It creates a positive pressure, which actually maintains a relatively constant FiO2. And because the gas is generally warmed uh, and completely humidified, there is going to be an improvement of mucociliary functions. The cilia can remain good and can function well to remove anything that is obstructing the respiratory system. All right, so with this in mind, the physiological outcomes are going to be, it reduces the respiratory rate, and by doing so, it reduces the work of breathing. It reduces carbon dioxide because it washes it off from the anatomic dead space. The humidification of the warm air facilitates mucus clearance, and therefore overall, this is going to improve oxygenation. All right. That ends all the devices that are in the market today. And therefore I'm going to pause here before we go to our game to see if you have any questions. Any questions? Okay, so at this juncture, we're going to have a quiz. And again, this is going to be using the program called Kahoot. For those of you who are new, what we're going to do is we're going to have fun with this particular activity. And we're going to um, play um, uh, Kahoot. And I'm going to ask you to take out your phone or open up a new app in your computer and go to kahoot.it, okay? But before there, uh, there is a question, is it common for the H form to be used instead of BiPAP? H, high flow oxygen, okay. All right, yeah. Uh, here, there's, a, there's an advantage to using the high flow instead of a BiPAP. The BiPAP usually is going to be the intervention that we're going to use prior to, or, or as the last measure 
before intubation. So there are advantages of high flow oxygenation. Um, there's also advantages to BiPAP, but BiPAP is going to be much more advanced and invasive as compared to a high flow oxygen. Okay, did that answer your question, Pierre? Great. All right. So what we're going to do now is to play what is known as Kahoot. And what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to go to Kahoot.it and I'm going to share you my screen. And the object of the game is you're going to answer the questions as quickly as you can. So go to www.kahoot.it, not .com, kahoot.it, and enter this game pin number, okay? And then we're going to go to the first question, and you will see color-coded um, options in your device, and that's how you're going to answer. So of you who are new, go to www.kahoot.it. And enter the game pin 922-7475. Or you could scan the QR code displayed on the monitor. Okay, if you're not able to join, you can just watch also and you can learn from it, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. And for those of you who are still struggling, the game pin will be displayed at the bottom even while we're playing. question was, oxygen via nasal cannula is more effective for a patient with, and the answer is the slow breathing pattern. And all of you uh, seem to have gotten that correctly. But the one that responded the fastest was Maria, followed by Drine, Udisha, Dimps, and Clint. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, so remember, whatever comes out from this device is always 100%. All right, so let's see who was the fastest. Maria, again.
Okay, um, you remember that um, physiologic PEEP is that which is influenced by the presence of nitrogen in the atmosphere. And so let's see. Maria, Odysia, Dryan, Mai, and Dimps again are in the lead. Okay, you remember we like to limit the amount of oxygen that we give to our patients to less than 60%. The reason is whenever we exceed 60%, we're beginning to compete a lot more with nitrogen, and therefore you're gonna wash off nitrogen, which results in ARDS. So the correct answer is there's a high likelihood of ARDS occurring. And so again, Odisha this time, Brian, Maria, Mai, Dimps, and April. Congratulations, you're the highest climber. So remember that the uh, increments of increase in FiO2 related to the liters per minute is for every liter that you put on the oxygen, it increases the FiO2 by 4%. So the correct answer here, therefore, is 36%. And so let's see Odisha drawing this time. Uh, Odisha, Dimps, April, and Maria are still on the board. Okay, so remember that when you use a simple face mask, you must exceed five liters of flow, which means to say six liters or above, it's going to be the acceptable uh, setting because we want to prevent the inhalation of carbon dioxide. And drying dimps, Disha, April, and mine. Everybody got that correctly. Very good. The fastest one was Brian, Dim, Sudisha, Mai, Maria, and Brian actually has the highest streak. Very good. Everybody seemed to have gotten that. So let's see. Drying Dim, Sudisha, Mai, Maria. Excellent. And the last one? Oh, second to the last one. OK, 
Okay, so let's take a look at this. Remember now that the purpose of this reservoir is to harvest the exhaled uh, volume of air from the anatomical dead space, which is rich in oxygen. Okay, so let's see. So the correct answer is to harvest the first third of exhaled volume. And Drine again, Udisha, Dimps, Clint, Sally, and Drine has a streak of seven correct answers in a row. Everybody got that correctly. So on the honor roll are the following. Dimps on the third place. Very good. Congratulations. Adisha, second. And the first is going to be five. Excellent. Congratulations to all. And I hope that you had fun with that. So let's go ahead and come back to here. And now I'm going to, just one moment. Okay, so I think that we had come to the conclusion of our presentation. And I'd like to, at this point, um, thank all of you for your attendance. I'm now going to stay on the line for any questions that you might have, and uh, I will do so for the next 20 minutes. So thank you once again for attending this webinar, and I hope that you will attend again in future seminar, uh, webinars. So once again, my name is Dr. Tom Madayag, and it is my pleasure to have been with you this morning. Thank you very much, and have a good day. I will stay for answering your questions, okay?